When I was a kid, the first taste of anime that I ever got was watching Dragon Ball Z on Toonami. I think it was Toonami. And Dragon Ball Z is a sequel to Dragon Ball. In the manga, it's all one thing, but in the anime, they split it up into Dragon Ball when Goku is a kid and Dragon Ball Z when he's an adult. The Dragon Ball part of the anime when Goku is a kid is famously based on an old Chinese novel, a classic. Chinese novel, the classic Chinese novel, which is sometimes called Journey to the West and sometimes called Monkey King. In Chinese, it is literally Journey to the West. And one of the two real protagonists of the book is someone called the Monkey King, hence Monkey King, depending on the translation. Monkey King Journey to the West is a four, 450 year old Chinese epic. A lot like the Greek and Norse mythologies that a lot of us ingest through Disney films or books or video games, this is a very fantastical and strange journey and, and, and world full of gods and monsters and utterly ridiculous feats and events. I don't know about you, but I often feel like when you read Greek mythology, it reads like it was written by a child. Like Zeus uh, went down to earth and he turned himself into a puddle. And then while he was a puddle, he seduced a woman. And then that woman gave birth out of her eye for, to triplets and those triplets became the moons and then two of them died and that's why we have one moon or something like that. It, it's utterly ridiculous and, and it really, if Greek myths were written now, they would be written by children. They would just be some utterly ridiculous story by a child that somehow got told and retold and retold over and over again and eventually published. Does anyone else notice this? Does anyone else see how utterly ridiculous Greek and, and, and Norse myths are? It's stupid. I love it. I love it to pieces. I love Greek mythology. I love Norse mythology in particular, but it's utterly ridiculous and so stupid. And if you like that stuff, and I like that stuff, I'm calling it stupid, I absolutely love it. If you love it, you need to read Journey to the West slash Monkey King. For the purposes of this video, from here on, I'm going to be calling the book Monkey King because that's the version that I've just read. That's the version that I have. That is the brand new translation of this story from Penguin, translated by Julia Lovell, who has done an astonishing job. So like I said, if you love the ridiculousness and the utter nonsense that, that you see in Greek mythology and Norse mythology, you're going to want to read Monkey King. This is a book full of crazy moments, ridiculous fantasy, over the top, things that just don't make any sense. The titular Monkey King, for example, mentions at one point that after he masters the thousand transformations that are possible to master, he can turn himself into literally the size of the universe, all the way down to literally the size of a hair. It feels like it was written by a child, and I am not saying that to, to diminish the wonderfulness of this book. These are good Good things. These are great, fun, ridiculous things, and I had a blast reading it from page to page. So what we have here this year, 2021, is a brand new translation of Monkey King by Julia Lovell, and it is fantastic. It's being published by Penguin in one of those beautiful cloth-bound editions. I read it on Kindle because my cloth-bound edition has not arrived yet. Post is late at the moment. The cover is stunning as well. This is a fantastic book. When we think classics, we either think one of two things, and I've thought both things depending on the mood that I'm in, the time of my life, whatever. We either think, oh, it's gonna be dry and it hasn't aged very well and it's gonna be full of problems and it's gonna be slow and it's gonna have long run-on sentences and I'm not gonna be interested. Or we think, ooh, a classic. So those are your two options, really. And Monkey King, I had never read it. I, I've read a lot of Chinese literature and translation. I've lived in China. I've traveled around China. I love Chinese literature and Chinese culture, but I'd never read the great classic. The great classic is Monkey King by Wu Chang'an. It is a 16th century novel that is revered. It has been adapted into cartoons and films. It's been translated multiple times. And in her translator's notes for this version, Julia Lovell talks about how language changes. And that's why we need to keep translating classics. And I was a little confused when I first read that. I thought, but the book hasn't changed. The language in the book hasn't changed. She meant English, English changes. And immediately when you start reading this new translation of Monkey King, 
you get it. You totally understand where she's coming from because the language that she uses in this book is young, it's vibrant, it's 21st century. She's using colloquialisms, she's using modern language to lure us into this 16th century fantastical Buddhist Chinese myth. Uh, it's fantastic. It reads like a modern novel and I think that's what helps it sound like it was written by someone very young with a vibrant imagination and a ridiculous flair for the theatrical and the fantastical and and the stupid. I absolutely adore that. It's camp and it is it is full of fun. If you're worried that this might be a dry classic, if you, you feel like, you know, you've never read Tolstoy or the Iliad or Ulysses because you're worried that these things will be too dry, do not come at this book, Monkey King, with that same philosophy, that same outlook. It is not that. This is a vibrant, utterly ridiculous fantasy novel. From start to end, it is a journey of excitement and bombast, and I loved it to pieces. The translation from Julia Lovell is astonishing. So what's it about? The story of Monkey King follows two main characters, the titular Monkey King and a traveling Buddhist monk. And this Buddhist monk was based on a real person who I don't know much about. So the titular Monkey King takes up the first quarter of the book, book one of the four books that it is kind of split into, and he is a ridiculous character. The book begins, as I've mentioned, very much like a Greek or Norse myth. It's a creation story. It tells the story of a mountain. At the top of this mountain is a rock, and that rock suddenly explodes into life and gives birth to a monkey. The monkey pops out of this rock, fed by the five elements, and then he's suddenly this monkey. And this monkey has a name, he's given a Buddhist name, which is Sun Wukong, and he's mostly just known as Monkey or the Monkey King, and he slowly learns things. He gets taught by a Buddhist master and he learns all the great powers, uh, fantastical, magical powers that anyone can possibly learn, and he goes to a dragon's temple or castle and he forces the dragon to give him some weapons and armor and won't go away until he has the weapon he wants and he ends up being given this giant iron staff which he can shrink and grow as much as he wants. So he's got this iron staff and he's got all these crazy powers and he learns to defy death. Before all of this, he, he lives in a cave behind a waterfall with all of his subjects, and he has like a kingdom of monkeys and a kingdom of other animals, and, and he's, he's the lord of the jungle, and he lives there for a, a long, long time, and then he gets all of these powers, he learns to defy death, and then he goes, right, I'm invincible, I'm perfect. And then he basically pisses off heaven, and slowly but surely he picks a fight with everyone in heaven. He ends up working in heaven because the uh, jade emperor of heaven decides that it's better better the enemy you know, keep him busy, give him a job and hopefully he'll behave himself, but he doesn't and he ends up getting drunk and breaking things and picking fights with people. And he's just a horribly unlikable protagonist. And he is our protagonist for the first quarter of the book. And he picks a fight with heaven and he ends up fighting people and blah, blah, blah. Eventually Buddha, literally Buddha comes along, fights him, defeats him and seals him under a mountain, puts him in this casket and he's locked under this mountain for 500 years. That's book one of four. That is the first quarter-ish of the book. We do then move on to our second kind of main protagonist, the journey to the West. This protagonist, this character, is a monk and he has a fantastic origin story. His father was killed and his mother was then kind of enslaved and forced to be the wife of the person who killed his father and she has a baby and she bites off the baby's toe so he can be recognized before Mosesing him down a river and so he goes off down the river and he's given a note to say you know who he belongs to etc and eventually he gets trained up to be a Buddhist monk pretty much from age naught he's trained up to be a Buddhist monk and then he goes to find his mom and his dad is dead eventually he's he's sent on a big journey there's also um a bodhisattva, I think that's how you say it, bodhisattva. But this bodhisattva, she locates him and she decides, ah yes, this is the disciple that we need. And what they need him for is that they decide that the southern kingdom of this world, which I, as far as I know is basically India, this southern kingdom isn't proper. It isn't developed enough. It isn't 
modernized enough and everyone there is a savage and a bit cringe thinking about it but they say right we need to send a bunch of buddhist scriptures down to this land to give everyone laws and guidelines and restrictions so that they can sort themselves out and be a bit more civilized and so they send this monk this titular character who was the baby with his toe has been off and now he's sent off on this journey and so he's got to collect these scriptures these buddhist scrolls then take those buddhist scrolls down to the south and his journey he's going to be met with demons and monsters and all of these crazy fantasy things they're going to kind of stop him and halt his path and he's going to have to use his mind to overcome them he is a buddhist so he's a vegetarian he's a pacifist and he needs to use his wiles to get past things fortunately Early in his journey, he meets Monkey. Monkey has been trapped under this mountain for 500 years, and he's now been set free, but he's got this band around his head that means that he can't really disobey too much, kind of like handcuffs or like a shock collar. And so he is the muscle. Monkey is now a kind of disciple, a kind of bodyguard of our monk, and the two of them go on this journey together. I won't tell you any more from there, that's where the real journey begins. So the first quarter is Monkey, it's all him, and there's all these ridiculous shenanigans that he gets up to where he turns himself into things, and it very much reads like any Greek or Norse myth where he does impossible things. He's kind of like Loki. You know, that story where Loki turns himself into a female horse and gets impregnated? Weird things like that happen to Monkey, especially when he's picking fights in heaven and then gets locked under a mountain. And then after that we get our, our main story, the introduction to our monk, and then the journey, the journey to the West, begins. Uh, the monk himself, he has like four different names. Uh, he has a birth name, and then he has the name Xuanzang. And Xuanzang, I believe, is actually the monk that he was inspired by, real life monk. But mostly throughout the journey, he's referred to as Guan Yin. Changing names in ancient China was a pretty ordinary practice, and some people would have several names throughout their life. I think that's a brilliant philosophy, personally. And so you have Guan Yin, I guess. Guan Yin is our monk, and monkey is his companion. What makes this such an exciting version of Monkey King is the translation. Now, Julia Lovell is awesome. She is a scholar of Chinese cultural studies, Chinese language. She's written several books about China. She's also married to Robert McFarlane, an author who I absolutely adore. So that's cool. So Julia Lovell has done an exceptional job retranslating this Chinese classic, injecting it with so much life and wit and modern comedy, and it reads like a modern fantasy novel mixed with a modern twist on kind of Greek and Norse mythology. I'm going to read out a few bits from quite early in the book, mostly from the the first quarter, the monkey parts, just to give you an idea of how witty and strange and fun and exciting and vibrant this book is. Monkey has just got himself into a spot of trouble, and someone helps him out and then says to him, if you breathe a word of what I did for you, I'll flay your wretched monkey carcass, grind your bones to dust, and banish your soul permanently to the place of ninefold darkness, and I'll only be getting started. Right you are, says monkey. It's this kind of recognizable British wit, right you are? It's fun. It's full of vibrancy and energy and I absolutely adore it. And there's one bit here where um, someone refers to Monkey as a mutinous macaque. I'm here on his majesty's orders, you mutinous macaque, to bring you to justice. Lost the will to live yet? I do have a vague memory, Monkey mused, of the Jade Emperor's marriage to a mortal by the name of Yang. I presume you're their undersized offspring. One touch of my staff will turn you into a pipsqueak pate, but I bear you no grudge and I'd like to spare your life. Off your trot now. Ah, oh, reading it out loud, it feels very British. Very specifically British sensibility, sense of humour and wit, and it's lovely. It's absolutely adorable. There's a real sense of the adorable to it, and it just makes it a joy to read. There's nothing dry about it. And it's not just the language either. There are kind of references to um, modern jurisdiction, modern politics, to make it seem more relevant to today. As an example, there's an entire chapter dedicated to this dragon king who gets annoyed because a, a seer, someone with foresight, a, a fortune teller, is able to tell a fisherman where to fish each day and then he's worried that the fisherman is going to basically take all the fish and the dragon king will have no subjects anymore. And so the dragon king disguises himself and he goes to see the fortune teller and he threatens him and then he ends up disobeying the emperor and then the emperor's prime minister is gonna hack off his head and the emperor says no don't do that don't don't do that but then he does it anyway and then 
the Emperor ends up dying and he goes to hell and then he has to be on trial and it's utterly wonderful. It's ridiculous and fun. There's a bit in this chapter where it says, the dragon's execution was preordained in the Book of Death and we've already set him on to his next reincarnation. But even though all this was clearly stated in the terms and conditions of his birth, he still insisted on suing you down here for negligence or perjury or some such, which then required you to die so you could appear in the court of the underworld. Process is process. Terribly sorry for the trouble. It's fantastic. You've got kind of modern sensibilities, modern things that are more relatable to us. It's still very, very clearly fantastical, mythological, ancient Chinese, and it, you know, it has a lot of references to Taoism and Buddhism, but there are just enough hints and references to make it feel like it's grounded in today and therefore relatable to us, and that's what makes it so special. That, coupled with the energized modern language and the fact that it has been stripped down and abridged just enough so that this is a consistently energized and exciting and fluid fantasy journey. And that's exactly what it is. It is a fantasy journey. Occasionally, as I say with the dragon story, the Dragon King, it is peppered with mythological tales, origin stories of certain characters. And there's a really colorful cast of characters here, Monkey being the most colorful of them all. But if you've never read Monkey King, Journey to the West. If you've never read it, now's the time. Julia Lovell's translation is fantastic. I have not read any other translation, to be clear. I cannot compare it to anything else. I am interested, but I also want to hold this very, very close to my chest and assume it's probably the best that you can get right now in terms of a translation of Monkey King. It just is the right length. It is full of colour and pomp and camp and splendour and excitement. It's energetic and fun and free. And this is what classic tales need. This is what mythology needs. If you're going to read mythology, if you're going to read classic novels, if you're going to read old fantasy, you need it to be energized and relatable. And Julia Lovell has done such a splendid job of translating and bringing Monkey King to the 21st century, to us as a modern audience. If you're going to read a classic Chinese novel, you're probably going to read Monkey King. It is the most famous of them all, and this is the best version that you're gonna get, I imagine. So go read Monkey King. If you love fantasy novels, if you love Greek mythology, if you love Norse mythology, if you love the ridiculous tales of gods and monsters in these stories, if you love journeys, if you love a story that takes you on a journey and just doesn't let up, you really need to read Monkey King. I've had such a wonderful, splendid, exciting time reading it. It makes me laugh out loud. It has made me gasp and, and feel shocked because so many absurd and strange and wonderful things happen in it. I've had such a blast reading it. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm sad that I waited until I'm as old as I am to read Monkey King, but I'm also really, really glad I did because this is the version I've ended up with. Julia Lovell's translation of Monkey King is fantastic and I am thrilled to have it. So go read it, go read Monkey King now. But before that, subscribe if you haven't for books and buy me a coffee. There's gonna be a link down below, buy me a coffee or three. I like coffee.